be here with you this morning. Uh, like he said, my name is Dan McClannan. I'm the student pastor at Westside Church. I've gotten to work with middle school and high school students for, uh, for several years now. Um, about uh, six years ago, God opened up a door for me to take uh, a two-year apprenticeship at the church that I'd grown up at um, to go back to school and to get my undergrad degree finally finished um, at around the age of 30. So I blew my first chance at college, and um, I don't know if anybody that's sitting here today feels like uh, that's, uh, that's kind of where you're at, that it's, you're having a tough time and you're struggling through this right now, but I was there, and I wish I had something like this going on in my life at that point in time, and sadly, I did not. Um, I kind of was just trying to do things on my own and, uh, and walk in my own path at that point in time, but God did get a hold of me. And, uh, and directed me into um, this deal that, that uh, he intended me for all along. And so it's been an awesome uh, time just of life to enjoy what uh, being in the middle of God's plan. And so um, I want to just share some of that with you today. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, not just a pastor. I am a husband and a father. Um, I, we have a, a non-traditional family and more and more... Um, you know, as we look around in society, we have more and more non-traditional families, and, and uh, so it's an interesting position as a pastor to have a non-traditional family. I had a, a daughter when I was in college. Um, I was never married. My wife, um, in, uh, in 2000, lost her first husband to leukemia. Um, she already had three boys of her own. We met in 2004 and married in 2005, so we have four kids together, and I'll let you uh, try and guess how old I am, but uh, we have three that are graduated from high school now and one that's still in high school. So it's a really awesome uh, place to be where God has really matched up my life with this youth ministry that I still get to be a part of, even though I'm, I'm growing older every day. I'm not in my 40s yet, though, for three more months. So, um, but uh, it, it is a sweet season because I can relate with parents and, and I'm still having a great time relating with students and stuff like that. So um, I know uh, they'll tell you in a lot of speaking classes that a good speaker will build credibility and, and, and build a case for why you should listen to what they have to say. Um, I am not going to try to build any sort of case on my own credentials or, or anything like that. Um, you know, I'm here to talk to you about God's Word and what that's done in my life and just share that with you. And that's really, that's all I've got. But I do, I do want to show you uh, something as I am learning more and more about myself. I'm in seminary right now, and uh, I'm in a Master's of Divinity program. And uh, I've, I've had the benefit of having some professors that have cared enough to really try and point out things that they see God doing in my life. I hope that you guys have teachers like that. I've heard some awesome things about Nebraska Christian and uh, what's happening here? I didn't know, I didn't know anything of this place. Um, even just a uh, like a year and a half ago, it was just a sign on 370 was was the only thing I had ever seen. And then this guy Dave Miller gave me a call one day and offered to buy me Chick Fil A, and I was like, well, I can't turn that down, you know. And and uh, next thing you know, Dave starts introducing me to people, and I'm introducing. And this guy's really really knows a lot of people already. He's he's a networking machine. And uh, here we go, fast forward a, a year later, and uh, we've got one of your guys on staff, and I'm here getting to speak with you guys and uh, know some of the musicians and other folks that are here. Jeff and I go way back. Um, he was in the youth group that I, uh, I started serving in as a volunteer and eventually uh, uh, did an apprenticeship there. So um, it's, man, it's so cool to be here and hear what's going on, and I'm sure that you have some professors like this as well. But... Um, this particular professor, he would write really great feedback on my papers. Like, I, I would read the feedback, and I was like, man, that was better than my paper, you know? And it would kind of, and I'd almost feel bad, because I'm like, I think he may have put more time into, into reading this and processing this. But um, he did something really cool. He, he drew a graph on my paper. And I, I've never had anybody else draw a graph. And I as he was handing them back and I saw this graph on the front of my, I was like, oh no, that can't, there can't, there's no good reason for, uh, for somebody to draw a graph on, on a, a literary work, right? So, uh, but this is, so I'm going to draw it for you so that you can kind of walk through this experience with me. 
And, um, and so, you know, we've got, we've got two sides of the graph here, and, and it started really low down here, and it slowly built and then, and then kind of crescendoed here like this, okay? And uh, as I had a chance to read it, I got to see what the labels were on, on the two different sides, and this, this really told the story of the graph. Um, what, it, what it said was on this side was uh, my productivity, okay? And, and, and so that was graphing my productivity. And then there was nothing down here, but all the way over here was this little word, deadline. And I was like, huh. And so I, I sat there for the whole class. I was mulling this over, and I was, can you guys all see this? Okay. So I, I was mulling this over, and I was thinking, I think he's calling me a procrastinator. I'm not sure, but this, I, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here. And so, um, so as I, I thought through it, I waited till the first break of, of class, and I went up, and I, and I asked him, I, I, I said, hey, you know, I, I really value your opinion, and uh, it, are you calling me a procrastinator? And he says, well, I'm actually asking a question. I'm asking you a question. And uh, let me phrase it this way. What day of the week are you taking off? And I said, well, I take, I take off Friday and Saturday. And he says, I think you should take off Monday. And he said, just, just mull that over for a minute. And I was like, huh. So I went back to my seat, and I, and I started to think about it, and I, and I realized that, like, Friday and Saturday probably represent, like, this part of the graph for me. Because my deadline is Sunday. You know, I teach on Sunday. That's when my opportunity to, to pour into students and our volunteer leaders to, uh, um, to rub elbows with staff and, and, and to come together and, and do what we've been planning uh, for the majority of the week. Now, a lot of stuff happens throughout the week, but, uh, but what we spend a lot of our time preparing for is on Sunday. And so I realized that he was actually giving me some really valuable advice uh, and pointing out that I really stink at something that I want to talk to you about today. And that's time management, okay? I have absolutely no credential to give you advice on time management. This is clearly something that I'm not very good at, but uh, it's something that God's word speaks to. I can't even tell you how many times I have finished an assignment with just enough time to hit print and get out the door for class or, or worked on a sermon um, and, and finished it even the very morning that, uh, that I was going to give it. Okay, um, that said, God wired me so that uh, I'm really only ready for something just in time, and that's, that's the way he wired me. So uh, where I spent a lot of my years maybe feeling like this was a weakness and this was, this was something that was wrong with me, this professor kind of called that out of me and said, take a look at what God's done in your life, what he's doing, and, and use that. He's made you this way, and he didn't do it on accident. So I'm going to stick to God's word, because uh, if, if I tried to give you my formula, uh, you'd all be waiting until the last minute to do your homework and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm sure none of the, uh, the, the school staff would, would appreciate me giving you that message. But I want things to move quickly in my life. I want to I progress to what's next. Um, see, I, 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 like I said, I spent some years kind of uh, wasting my first opportunity at college and, and doing some other things. And I have felt like I've been perpetually behind since then. And I want things to move forward. I, I long for the thing that's next. And I don't know if anybody can relate with me on that, but I look forward to achieving the things I'm working at now and getting to enjoy the fruits of those labors. I'll give you an example. At my current rate of five or six credits per semester, I should finish seminary in December of 2020. <laughs> now, nothing about that is very encouraging to me. Um, that's a long ways away. We should have like flying cars and stuff by then, right? But that's, that's what the timeline is right now. And it is tough for me to let that happen on, um, on that schedule. I, I would much rather see it happen on my schedule. And I can, um, I kind of have this... Um, 
this rut that I fall into where I think, you know, this is going to pass, and then this season's going to pass, and then things are going to get easier, and then everything will just kind of fall into place. But my experience tells me that, yes, this too shall pass, and then there's going to be something else just as tough or, or, or maybe tougher to come along right behind it. And that life's not going to get easier, and if I keep looking on ahead, I might miss something. The truth is that I need to take hold of what's today to claim today for Christ in my life and not miss what he wants to do right now in this season of my life. If you brought your Bible today, let me ask you to go ahead and open it to uh, the book of Matthew. I love the Sermon on the Mount, that, that section of Scripture, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And um, left to my own device, I would probably preach almost exclusively out of this because I just love this. It's such great stuff that Jesus gives us here. And in chapter 6, verse 34, just this one verse, I think he gives us a very rich call and a challenge. Matthew 6, 34 in the NIV says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I think there's something really profound about this because as I look to tomorrow, I want to envision it as being free from trouble, from being free from worry, and, and I will get beyond the stuff that I'm dealing with right now. But the truth is, Jesus says that tomorrow is going to have worries of its own. And if I wait and hang on to this ideal that I can really get in and enjoy life and, and, and make some things happen when I arrive at this place where I don't have any worries or any trouble, it's never going to happen. I'm never going to be able to take hold of what God wants for my life. I'm guessing you've heard this verse before, and uh, as you think about it today, I wonder what your worries are, what your concerns are and your cares are, and what are the things that, that today causes uh, a little bit of stress or, or friction in your life? Um, maybe as you hear this, you, you think, man, that would be sweet if I didn't have to worry about homework. You know, homework's all about what's due tomorrow, right? Um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe there's something that you've got to take care of today that you're not looking forward to. And, um, and you know, but you need to do it to be prepared for tomorrow. And uh, I want to be clear that I don't think what Jesus is telling us here is that, um, is that we shouldn't plan. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I think, on the contrary, what he's saying is that time spent planning is, is time well spent. But time spent worrying is sinful. When we take the time that God has trusted us with today and spend it on worrying about tomorrow, that that's sinful. That we don't steward what he's given us well, and that we just let it pass, producing only worry. You know, we sing this song, and we raise our hands, and we sing, Whom shall I fear? You know, I've got the God of angel armies on my side. And if we believe that, then we're not going to worry about some of the small things that are, that are going on in our lives. When it seems like the odds might be against us, if we believe the God of angel armies is on our side, we don't need to worry. We don't need to spend today concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, I, I grew up in a really great family. My, my mom and my dad are, uh, to this day, the biggest influences in my life. Um, they modeled Christ's love for me um, in so many ways. Um, and that's not to say that, uh, that they didn't, didn't speak to me in tangible ways, but, man, the way they lived their life was a powerful witness of the love of Christ. It was hard for me to imagine how I would become um, a person like my dad, but I wanted to. Um, a few years back, uh, as I was beginning to, uh, to get my feet wet in ministry, 
and I was realizing that uh, some of the damage that had happened in my relationship with my parents when I was younger had really never been repaired, um, I got a troubling call from my mom. And she said, you should come down to the hospital. Your dad has been admitted. And I was just like, man, what's going on here? My dad is a picture of health. Um, he, he's a, a, a cyclist, so he, he rides, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles um, at a time. And um, he's been a, a pilot. He's, uh, he eats good. He's never smoked. I mean, he, he's the picture of health. And I'm thinking, what on earth? And she said, they're running some tests. You should get down here. And so um, I get down to the hospital, and they, they tell me that, my, that in order to see my dad, I need to go to the OR waiting room. And, you know, the OR, the operating room. And I'm thinking, why is my dad in surgery? You know, and I'm getting up there, and I've got so much worry, so much anxiety, so much just like my stomach is just like a ball of nerves. And I get up there, and, um, and my mom's there. Uh, some of my other families there, and uh, and they say, well, he he thought he was sick, and he came in. They did a chest X-ray, and they found a mass in his lungs, and they are um, afraid that he has advanced lung cancer. And so, what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to open him up. They're going to take a look in there, and if it's cancer, then they're going to just take that lung out right now. And there is uh, a possibility that a person wouldn't survive this surgery, but you have to do it. This is, this is their chance to stop this. So in the course of like an hour, I've gone from thinking I have all the time in the world to fix things with my dad to realizing that I may never get to talk to him again, ever. He's already behind that door. He's, he's already back there. And man, I got on my knees. I prayed like I've never prayed before. Man, I was just banging on the gates of heaven. God, please spare my dad. I just wanted a little bit more time. I knew that I needed to do something differently. And uh, I, I started sharing this with my mom. We started talking. We started praying. And... Um, she pulled out something that my dad had written before, before he went back. And basically, it said that he didn't have any regrets. And I was like, wow. It really hit me hard because I was being faced with a ton of my own regrets at that very moment. And I realized that he had come to terms with who he was, it, his own flaws. You know, he wasn't perfect. He made mistakes along the way. But he realized that and knew that, hey, I gave this thing a good shot. I've, I've tried to live for Christ. I've, I've taken advantage of the, of the days that God's given me here. And if that's the end, if that's as much as God's going to give me, that's enough. I trust God for this. And he said that he trusted God with our lives, too. And that really did something to me because, um, once again, as an adult, my dad was modeling something for me about the way Christ wants us to live. He was modeling for me that we can take a lot of peace in knowing that if we just do what God asks us to do each day, that whenever the end comes, that it's as God planned. And there's, there's great biblical um, examples of this type of an attitude all the way through the Bible. Um, another thing I, I love, you know, my parents... They named me after a Bible character. They named me Daniel. You know, I go by Dan, but, you know, my mom still calls me Daniel. I don't know why. That's, that's like never, never quite been able to break her of that. But um, the cool thing about getting a, a Bible name is that uh, 
you know, when you don't know what to read, you can always go to, to that, that story that, uh, that your name is in, and you think, wh- you know, why did my parents want to name me after this guy? And so um, as, as I read the story of Daniel, you know, there's some great stuff in there. This guy was a prayer warrior and everything. But I want to look at, um, at this, uh, just a couple of verses from Daniel 3, 16 through 18. You guys are familiar with this story, I'm sure. Uh, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And um, if not, you've probably seen the Veggie Tales version growing up. And, um, but, uh, so, so you, know, you know the story here. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has, has made this, this law that you either bow or you burn. And, uh, and these guys say, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to do that. That's against God. He's told us not to do that. And we're not going to do that. And so they, they bring him in, and, uh, and King Nebuchadnezzar says that he's gonna have, they're going to have to answer to him. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And I realize in this passage, there's a tangible deal that these, that these three have to say, I'm not going to bend my knee to this. In my life, it wasn't a huge statue of gold or a king. In my life, it was tomorrow. I'm not going to bend my knee to tomorrow and miss out on what God has for me today. And these guys were, were studs, honestly, as, as I read this story. And, and if, if you stop and think about what they were saying... Like, there's this super hot furnace that, like, literally consumed one of the men that was, like, throwing firewood in there or however they did that back then. I don't know how an ancient furnace worked. I'm not going to try to give you a lesson on that. But this thing was clearly pretty hot. And they realized that there were strong men that were fully capable of throwing them in there. They'd already seen somebody die. And they said, but even if, God doesn't choose to save us. I'm still not going to do that. That's the kind of courage, that's the kind of boldness that I think it takes to take hold of each day and set aside what's off in the future. And they, they point out an ugly truth that sometimes what we want is not the same thing as what God wants. We have this flesh that's going to pull us in a different direction than, than God's will. And so there is part of us that wants things contrary to what God wants. I'm not sure we can trust our own desires when it comes to what's better. So we've got to trust God's will. As I was looking through Scripture and... Um, and wondering how to, how to kind of land the plane here with this, with you guys today. Um, God brought something really cool to my mind. And he showed me that his son Jesus went through this very thing. And I think it's so cool when we get to see these images of Jesus, fully God and fully man, going through the same things that we struggle with. And I'm just going to... Um, if, if, if you want to look at this, this is in Luke twenty two, forty two. Jesus is in the garden on the eve of his crucifixion. He's praying with his disciples, and, and he goes off and, and, and prays by himself several times. And essentially, his prayer is this. Father, not my will, but yours be done. I don't know if that's ever hit you, that Jesus... The Son, the, the, the second person of the Trinity, saying to the first person of the Trinity, not my will, 
but yours be done. I don't know how much time God is going to give you. I don't know how much time God's going to give me. My, uh, my boss is a great guy. He's uh, done ministry for a lot of years, and he, uh, he told me this story about a good friend of his. This guy was an overachiever. He graduated at the top of his class, got a full ride, went and finished his, his undergrad degree in record time, went on to seminary, had graduated his Master's of Divinity by the time he was 25 years old. He was married, had a small child, and he was moving his family to a new city to do his first pastorate. They had moved into the parsonage owned by the church. And on his very first day of work, he went anxious to get this ministry started that he had prepared all his life for. And as he pulled out of his driveway, he was hit by a speeding car and died that day. All of the ministry that he did came during a season of life where he believed that he was preparing for something in the future. According to my boss, he was an awesome guy and impacted the lives of so many people through his college years and his years in seminary that um, to this day, he says, I still hope one day I can have the type of impact that guy had building God's kingdom here on earth. Guys, I hope that you're able to set aside your will and your desires and your hopes for tomorrow in order that you can take hold of what God has for you today. I want to just create just a quiet moment for you right now. If there's something on your heart that you need to just give up to God and just let Him take, God's Word says to cast all of our cares upon Him because He loves us. We know that God is powerful, that he's in control, and we know that his plan is good. So take this quiet moment and just give these things up to God. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. If, if it helps you to open your hands and just, and just be open to what God has for you, just take a moment.